Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for joining us. Today on Think Tech, we have some great guests, but before I introduce them, I want to just mention the uh, SACNAS conference that's coming up in late October. This is a Society for the Advancement of Chicanos, Native Americans, and Science. They're now expanding to other underrepresented groups, including Pacific Islanders. They're going to be a huge conference out here uh, in the convention center at the end of October, early November. Really great event. Folks should all plan to look it up and, and join in. So uh, be ready for that. Anyhow, uh, I have with me today uh, Dr. Song Choi. Uh, welcome, Song. Good to see you and, again. And Greg Nakano. Welcome, Greg. Uh, uh, both affiliated with U UH. Uh, Song is the Assistant Dean of Engineering, and Greg is with a, a group called Pacific Allies. Um, and they're doing amazing stuff in a lot of different fields, but we are specifically <laughs> going to be talking about sort of STEM education and why why that's in, in our interest as a, as a whole, as a country, and what we can do to make sure it gets continued to be promoted and advanced. Uh, but maybe we can begin a little bit, maybe you can tell us about the Pacific Allies program, give people a little context. Okay, thank you. Um, Pacific Allies was started as a program to help look at how do we teach next generation leaders the impacts of climate change on national security. And the whole idea is that you know, it takes you 20 to 30 years before you really become a senior military leader, an admiral, a general, or even just a colonel sometimes. So if you're not being exposed to kind of the impacts of climate change on national security, when you're a cadet, a midshipman, then how are you even going to understand what you're looking at in some place like Bangladesh or, you know, a small Pacific island if you were never exposed to it, you know, younger? Excellent, excellent. And so, when did you sort of get, uh, get this bug to get climate change in the engineering curriculum, as it were? <laughs> so, so, climate change has been an engineering problem for decades and decades. And, you know, my background with underworld robotics and a lot of the robotic stuff now with the uh, unmanned aerial systems, we're constantly trying to figure out how we can get more data to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, STEM, climate change, places that I have uh, not the quite the level of uh, STEM education that we, we have. Mm -hmm. We want to try to influence as much as we can. Right, because these, these places face a particular burden, uh, particularly the freely associated states, right? Because we have this sort of ticking clock going now, right? <laughs> the Compact uh, yeah. of uh, Freedom Free Association, yeah. right? COFA, yeah. it's known. And the COFA agreements are due to expire in 2023, I yeah. believe. And although certain parts of them will continue to exist in perpetuity, other parts sort of disappear then, mm -hmm. uh, including a lot of the money that is currently goes out each year to mm -hmm. these things. And when that happens, there's liable to be some significant social changes, right? Economic changes as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, you know, it's, I think there's a reason why we have always had an interest in the South Pacific region. It's, mm -hmm. Geographically very desirable, right. uh, and I think there are many other nations surrounding that region that see the exclusive economic zone benefits, and maybe even things underwater that have a lot of significant benefits. So many, many countries and regions are pretty much eager to get their hands on it, and you know, luckily, until 2023, which is snap, snap, is that. Right. We still have some sort of influence on it. I think we need to figure out how to maintain that. Yeah, and, and it's, it's real clear from people in the region that, for instance, the Chinese are mm -hmm. making significant inroads mm -hmm. in trying to cut business deals mm -hmm. there, build uh, infrastructure for them, giving them really very nice deals to in entice them, basically, entice their governments into aligning more closely with China. Mm -hmm. Right now, because of our exclusive economic zone, we can essentially as I understand it, allow or unallow any ships from any nation to enter that, right? No, of course, of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, exclusive economic zone, EEZ, gives you a huge advantage of what you can do in that region. I mean, simply, even fishing rights. Uh, you look at the vast number of square footage or square mileage of what you're controlling down there, that's a lot of fishing zones. Mm -hmm. And as populations grow, one of the places you're looking to gather more food are the oceans. And right. a lot of countries have a lot of big populations. 
Although all the projections that I've seen mm -hmm. basically sort of say we shouldn't be counting on getting more food from the ocean because yeah. most of the major fishing stocks have hit their yeah. peak and are declining yes. some fairly rapidly. Yeah. I mean, I think they said we've reached more than 50% of what the oceans are supposed to produce. Mm -hmm. So we're now on the downhill end of the food process. Oh, yeah. if, if we've hit peak fishing, that's a, that's, that's a dangerous concept, right? Because yeah. uh, some 3 billion people in the world depend on Seafood basically is a main protein source, right? Yeah, well, I think that's where the climate change and the uh, sea level rise come into play. Uh, mm -hmm. Climate change has obviously changed the way fish migrate. Mm -hmm. uh, it has changed how coral reefs develop or get destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, as more coral reef gets destroyed, uh, less food we're going to cultivate from the ocean. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're really on a downhill trend here, and I think. Every effort and all effort that we make to do this conservation, sustainability, resilience type stuff has to come into uh, some sort of a single point uh, agreement or net. Yeah, it's one of these issues too. It's global in nature, right? Mm -hmm. You can't decide country A can't decide we're going to go one way and country B says we'll go the other way. Although no. it does happen, you don't get anything done, yeah. right? You can't because the air that we breathe blows elsewhere and we breathe the air that's been in other countries. And so... Yeah. It has to be a consorted effort. If, yeah. if anybody starts becoming very selfish, I think we're just bound to go downhill. Yeah. That's what we're trying to see if we can help curtail some of them. I mean, we're never going to stop any of this, but maybe we'll get enough people to be on the side that's curtailing the development and the destruction and advancing. Right. I mean, you want to see a uh, good, well-educated Mm -hmm. Residents of all these areas who can look at evidence and say, where, where, what does this evidence tell me? Where, where does this lead? What, what, how should I decide which way to jump here, right? Shall I go out and keep fishing what I know is an overfish stock and watch it plummet further so my kids won't have anything? Or shall we try to set some limits on it now today and, mm -hmm. and make it sustainable? Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, one of the areas down there that we have a particular interest in is because of our military ties, and that's Kwajalein Atoll. Right. And you know, I'm going to have Greg talk a little bit about how we're trying to get the cadets and midshipmen, and especially uh, our ROTC, University of Hawaii ROTC programs, to hopefully in the near and far futures become much more involved, where we do see some engineering students in the ROTC pool. Uh, we're hoping that we can get a, a greater number of engineering students and maybe, as Greg mentioned, uh, at a young, early age, they can have an understanding about what these atolls and the South Pacific region is like and the type of problem that they're facing and how it has a direct relationship to how it's supposed to get rid of uh, Waikiki and make <laughs> UH the oceanfront property of the future. You know? so. Excellent. Yeah, why don't you tell us about, about what you're trying to get happening here? I, I think the biggest thing goes back to kind of like, how long does it take for curriculum? We, we talked a little bit about this when we were outside. It's like, how long does it take for curriculum to catch up with the needs that you're looking at? Mm -hmm. So I went to school undergrad when in the late 1980s. And when we were being taught about national security threats, we still had the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And, you know, national defense or... Threats were looked at like a Russian or a Soviet motorized rifle division coming through the folded <laughs> gap, right? And that was, that, you know, that was national security. I think, I think the challenge is, is then how do you begin looking at something like sea level rise or loss of a freshwater lens or shifting cultivation zones for wheat or other staple crops as a national security threat? And if your future national security leaders aren't thinking in those terms, and they're only going to see the famine. They're only going to see, you know, the flood. But then they're not going to recognize, hey, all this conflict that is being generated as a result of this really comes from something else that really is a climate-related issue. Right. And we already, mm -hmm. there is at least some evidence suggests much of the, the trouble in Syria is, all, mm -hmm. is actually mm -hmm. was caused by several bad years of drought, right. basically. that drove a lot of the farmers into the cities, got the cities yeah. too crowded, short on supplies. and momented yeah. unrest, basically. Right. And, yeah, uh, I mean, you can just see that kind of scenario playing out in other places with even worse results, right? And Syria is bad uh, enough. I mean, you know, technological development 
has its advantages, but uh, when it becomes very monetized, you know, monetized or monetary, you know, we do things without really thinking 20, 30, 50 years into the future. I mean, I think a good example is when we cut down a lot of trees because it's an immediate economic effect for you. Mm-hmm. And then you realize 5, 10, 20 years down the line that you've created potential landslides when it rains, California, mm-hmm. or uh, potential sandstorms in uh, central China because of all the forests that they've cut down. Mm-hmm. So, so I think it's the same thing with the, with the ocean. Like we've over-exploited what the ocean can give to us, and now it's producing these things where, for the South Pacific, these sea level rise is really hitting people's homes. Well, yeah, it's very personal. <laughs> and the, the combination of the sea level rise, the warming, mm-hmm. and the acidification mm-hmm. is really putting a, a triple threat onto the coral, mm-hmm. also on the added burden of pollution, which uh, really can impact coral too. And since something like 80% of all the marine species live in or on coral reefs at some point in their life cycle, uh, if the reefs collapse, uh, that's bound to have huge (laughs) impacts on the whole food web, right? That's right. Yeah. So one of the things that we're trying to do is that we've gotten the uh, uh, Annapolis, uh, the the Naval Academy, the Coast Guard Academy involved. Uh, We're hoping West Point, some of the other places are involved. We'll get their cadets and midshipments out here and send them out and the like that we did in the last two years uh, and have them visually realize what's going on. I mean, to me, it's, it's almost like electrical engineering versus mechanical engineering. Uh, when I say uh, electricity flows down wires, how are you supposed to visualize that? You, you don't visualize that. But if I put blue water into a clear tube like your water bottle, and send it down, you know that there is water going mm-hmm. down that thing. And I think it's the same thing. Oh, as Greg mentioned, our threats from Russia, uh, Soviet Union back in the 80s, that was a very visual threat. Mm-hmm. You see tanks and missiles. You know, now we're dealing with something that's relatively invisible. It's almost like that old thing, you know, when our age, when they were telling us, be careful about carbon monoxide. <laughs> I think it's the same thing. Uh, we're, we're we're dealing with something that we don't instantly visualize, but right. it's coming. Right, and, and the, the issues uh, the, I was think, I've been thinking of crises recently, mm-hmm. and the, the issues of cyber crises mm-hmm. are sort of it's a whole new form mm-hmm. of crisis that we never really it didn't it didn't exist some years ago, mm-hmm. and now it's very real. There's mm-hmm. so much stuff that is controlled by uh, th- via the internet that yeah. that if somebody can put a big enough bug in the system. Right. Basically, many, many other systems could start collapsing in a fairly ugly cascade of events, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, when I was working a lot with the uh, uh, robotics uh, arena, a lot of it is still wireless communication. Right. And we always talk about the cyber aspects mm-hmm. of how you can uh, steal somebody's signal and control that vehicle. I, I think it's getting a little beyond that now, where it's not only the cybersecurity that the communications that we need to worry about. I think there's a lot of these electromagnetic uh, frequency type stuff that we deal with, even from many, many decades ago in terms of military warfare, that maybe they're all related in just one security measure. Okay, we're going we're to dig more deeply into that <laughs> when we come back. Uh, right now, we have to take a quick break. I'm told. Uh, Song Joy, Greg Nicano are with me here from UH. We're talking about STEM education and the, the COFA agreements. We'll be back in one minute. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Hey, hey. 
Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to back to Think Tech, to Think Tech Hawaii, Likeable Science. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, Song Choi and Greg Nakano uh, from UH are here with me. We're talking about STEM education and the COFA agreements. And we were in the first part uh, talking about a specific area, Kwajalein, particularly Kwajalein Atoll, and uh, even more particular, the island of Ibai. Uh, I suspect some of our viewers probably don't know too much about it, and I think we've got a, a photo that gives some sense of it. Uh, right. Uh, Greg, tell us a little bit about eBuy. <laughs> I'm, honestly, I'm still learning a lot myself, but um, Kwajalein Atoll is considered one of the largest, if not the largest atoll in the world, and it consists of over 90 different islets. Uh, eBuy is one of those little islets, and as you can see from the picture there, it's rather crowded. They have somewhere in the range of about 9,000 to 12,000 people. They don't have a, you know, they haven't had a solid count uh, mm -hmm. in recent times. And about 900 people support or work on the U.S. military base, which is about a 10 or 15 minute ferry ride away, um, which is the U.S. Army base. And so when we were looking for how do you teach climate change impacts on national security, we obviously wanted to look at a place that was being impacted by climate change today, sea level rise mm -hmm. and those impacts today. But then we also needed to find a place that was of interest from a national security perspective to the United States, to the cadets themselves. And a lot of people probably don't know this, but you know, uh, Kwajalein Atoll is used as a bullseye or the calibration mm -hmm. for the nuclear missile test that we shoot from Vandenberg. I see. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it has that. It's not reassuring. <laughs> yeah, so, it, so it has that function. And the other thing they have is something called a space fence, where they're actually tracking satellite and you know space debris and apparently they're at the point now where they can track like softball size you know debris or satellites out there so sea level rise will impact both communities you know right at, these are low-lying low-lying at, at, at all probably no point on them more than six to ten feet above sea level right absolutely yeah. and so this this was the whole thing is the department of defense recently did a study and what they did was they said, well, how long before the freshwater lens, which allows the plants to grow and things like that, disappears? And they found out it could be as early as uh, 2035, which is only about, right, which is only about 15 <laughs> years away. Um, best case scenario is 2065, which is 45 years away. And even then, that's within the lifespans of the kids who are going through school right now. So that's really what we're trying to do is say, okay, you said likable science. In this case, science isn't, you know, <laughs> isn't necessarily your friend. But it's like if you really understand what the challenges are and you understand science and you understand you know, science, technology, engineering, math, then you know what your options are. Right. And then the, exactly. Right. And, the, and then the earlier you, you know, earlier you're talking about slow onset disaster, right. right? The earlier you can start making decisions based on data rich mm -hmm. analysis the more, you know, the better your outcomes are going to be. Absolutely, absolutely. No, and it's, it's, it's frightening to watch people refuse to acknowledge that. And, mm -hmm. and these islands are, are wonderful sort of canaries in the coal mine, as it mm -hmm. were, uh, where they are being impacted very seriously. They're losing parts of their shoreline. People uh, complain because they can't get out to visit their ancestors' graves because that's all mm -hmm. underwater now. When, when they were a kid, that was all above water. Right. And, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I mean, you know, um, as Greg mentioned, the whole fact that maybe in this case, science is not the likable side, but <laughs> what it's given us is this huge advantage of utilizing the potential of all the data we can gather from there. I mean, we've, we've seen uh, simulations of how Waikiki is going to disappear in the right. next 50, 60 years. So why not start doing something about it now? Right. And 
Uh, we want to see if we can send things down there. We, we, we've done a lot of stuff in our state with uh, robotics and how we're trying to get uh, young kids excited and understanding of these uh, new technologies and exposure to even new ones that hasn't even come out yet. And we're trying to do the same out there. We're trying to get them to understand uh, the importance of vehicles like uh, unmanned aerial systems. Uh, maybe even an unmanned underwater vehicle. And instead of us going down there and taking random data every three months, six months, why can't we just transfer some of that knowledge, uh, educate many of the kids there to have a greater understanding about these type of technologies and have them be our contact in gathering those data. Absolutely. You know, if we have too much data, what's well, better than not having <laughs> enough data, right? Yeah. So. At the same time, that, that's then building a, a STEM literate mm -hmm. workforce down mm -hmm. there, which, which they really need. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they are going to cope effectively with, with mm -hmm. climate change and sea level rise and the various impacts of this, mm -hmm. they, they need uh, a citizenry who really understands the, these issues, understands what the impacts are going to be, understands there are options, how engineering can be used, how, mm -hmm. what technology can and cannot do, what it mm -hmm. might be able to do. Um, yeah. You raised a really interesting point. You're talking about slow onset, and, and then you talked a little bit about Syria. The United <laughs> Nations International Organization on Migration went and did some projections, and they said by 2050, they really think there could be as many as a billion climate refugees. But you know, when they looked at the range, they said, okay, 200 million climate refugees at 2050 is about what we think is going to be you know, the number that's about right. Syria right now is about 6 million people who are either refugees or internally displaced. So you multiply that, and that's what potentially we're looking at just from climate refugees. Right. So what we're trying to do is say, hey, you know that the best science is telling us you're going to lose your freshwater lens. How do we work together? Mm -hmm. And how do we co-develop a lot of these research projects so that as you are getting new information, we're working with you to ensure that, one, you can stay on your home island longer, but two, that when you come to Hawaii or you go back to the mainland or wherever you, wherever you need to go to, you're going to bring with you ex knowledge, experience, skills, you know, capabilities that are going to be valuable for the place that you're having to move to. Yeah, absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, this issue is not just confined to these small islands of coast, right. but right? Oh, no, all, all around the world, the aquifers right. are being depleted faster mm -hmm. than they're being refilled. There are already simmering tensions over water rights in various different places, parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Any of those reasonably easily could fairly quickly erupt it into uh, a much worse situation. Mm -hmm. You know, one crisis breeds another crisis, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, all right. You look at the continental U.S. map, the way it's projected in terms of simulations is that the mm -hmm. middle of the United States and the sides, the coastal lines of the United States are supposed to disappear. So I, I think we need to figure out how to if not stop, at least slow it down enough that we come up with better solutions. I mean, engineering, that's all it is, coming up with solutions. Right, and we can do things. You can, you can now genetically engineer plants to tolerate more heat, <laughs> tolerate more drought, tolerate right. more salt, right. all of which might be very useful traits, right, right. Uh, in the future. Uh, they already have salt, salt-tolerant taro, right, uh, growing in, in a variety of places now, um, and that, that's saving a lot of people's lives and livelihoods. And, mm -hmm. and I think the other important thing is being able to blend modern technologies, mm -hmm. STEM, right, science, right. technology, uh, engineering, and math with the indigenous knowledge and wisdom and begin putting all of these high-tech tools and systems into the context of either place-based education mm -hmm. or project-based learning where the Marshallese themselves are defining what they need to collect, what they want to know mm -hmm. about more, and then us on the backside, we're working with a development team or something like that. So the first year, you know, the first summer that we did this, we really were focused on how are we helping the American cadets and midshipmen understand the situation, you know, in the Marshall Islands. Over the past two years, really, we flipped that model. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is the American cadets and midshipmen are coming down and they're doing service learning. Mm -hmm. And really what they're trying to do is help the Marshallese. We, you know, the Marshallese have their own summer program. We now are going to directly support the e by Spartan camp Excellent. and uh, through IHS, Infinitum Humanitarian Systems, and uh, Office of Naval Research this summer. 
what we're going to be doing is helping them do a map of the uh, city of Ebuy and then also do their first demographic survey so that they'll be able to say how many people they have, what, you know, where do they live, and things, which is in their hands now. It's not an American right. coming down. It's not <laughs> someone from the Capitol coming down. It's right. like yeah. they can kind of do their own survey anytime that's they That's great because they'll get better data that way. Right. You know, yes. There won't be outsiders right. coming in asking intrusive questions. It'll right. be their neighbors who are saying, hey, we're just trying to figure this out, right? Right, right. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, we, we, we want that self-sustaining uh, system to grow. Uh, and. Hopefully, we'll be able to set up some sort of pathways where if we do see uh, people from that region want to have specific knowledge in something, that they'll be able to come over and get that knowledge and hopefully go back and help make whatever situation they have a little bit better. And, you know, who knows? Yeah. And we were joking about the fact that we have these drone piloting uh, competitions going on here. and. Maybe one of those kids that have been playing with the drone every day for the next couple of years to gather all that data yeah. will be one of the champions or something. Absolutely. absolutely. Anything is possible. Yeah, you know, this, this, is, this is great. And it's wonderful to learn about the, this, the interest you have, the efforts, the pr actual programs that are running, the fact that you're engaging more people in mm -hmm. them. If uh, some of our viewers want to get in touch with you, you I assume they could do so, and, and you'd welcome yeah. all the help you can get, right? Yeah, I mean, of course. This, this is, you know, uh, if, if, if they're interested in contacting us, uh, if you guys have the thing, but yeah, we can send our email addresses yeah. or uh, yeah, get in touch with whatever contact or information. Whatever. We could always always make contact. Well, excellent. Uh, very very interesting to learn about this. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot of aspects. Perhaps we'll come back and talk about this again sometime and, sure. and tell us give Let us updates us and us focus in on specific programs and all that kind of good stuff. I mean, you know, Greg has a couple of uh, midshipmen coming in this summer, so. Excellent. Maybe before, during, after. Yeah, we'll get, be get, get them to come on and tell, tell us what they're doing first. That would be great. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that'd be excellent. Well, thank you so much, Greg. And thank you so much, Song. Always. Thank Song you. Choi, Greg Nakano, both from UH, and I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, thanks for joining us here on Likeable Science, and I look forward to seeing you on future episodes. Until then.